as you know, takes these very seriously. And um, so please fill them out, turn them into the office. Know that he is keeping track of this from his hospital bed. It is now my pleasure to introduce to the podium our member, Dr. Jill Wakefield, Chancellor of Seattle Community College, who will introduce our main speaker. Jill. Please welcome me in welcoming U.S. Undersecretary for Education, Dr. Martha Cantor. It's a pleasure to be here this afternoon. Uh, what Jill didn't tell you is that I am also a 15-year Rotarian and went with the Palo Alto uh, for six years and Cupertino for um, nine. And it was sad to let go of that. I was going to be president of Rotary in Palo Alto July 1, 2010. But when you get a call from the president of the United States through his secretary, Arnie Duncan, and you say, say yes without giving it a second thought, and then you call your mother and say, what did I do? And she said, just go, and I did. Um, I had to give that up because you have to give up all of the boards you serve on to go into public service um, and, and certainly look forward to going back to that when this service is done. I'm very excited to be joined by Maria Goodlow Johnson, your superintendent of Seattle uh, Public Schools. Thank you for being here. And Jill Wakefield, Dr. Wakefield is doing a tremendous job, and she is actually taking the legacy from Dr. Mitchell uh, of the Seattle Community Colleges, moving them forward. Uh, I'm going to step back and give you a little bit of a big picture here and then tell you what we are doing in Washington and then hopefully take some questions from you. In 2005, we in this, in this country had a population of 296 million people. And when we look ahead to 2050, we expect America's population to reach 438 million. And if you look at diversity across America, during this period from 2005 to 2050, Hispanics will increase from 14% to nearly 30%. African Americans will stay as a stable population at about 13%. The Caucasian population will decline from 67% to 47%. The Asian population will grow from 5 to nearly 10%. And foreign-born residents will grow from 12 to 19%. So we have tremendous diversity shaping our future. And we need to understand that the cultures and histories of the people who will make up the complex of American, the American public is going to shift and change as we move forward. Now, within that demographic shift, we basically have several major challenges ahead of us. We have an aging and declining workforce. I'm part of that. I'm 60 a labor shortage, as you've seen across the country, um, even though we've had a very difficult time the last couple of years. We have a labor shortage because we have hundreds and hundreds of jobs that will need to be replaced, in addition to the fast-growing fields. If you look at K-12 education, we're going to need thousands more teachers coming in, health care at 16 percent of our gross national product, we are going to have you know, uh, more than 20% of the jobs being in health careers. Another problem we have is an unacceptable dropout rate. Every 26 seconds, a student drops out of school. That's unacceptable for America. And I know superintendent is facing this every day. Uh, we also, at the same time, has, have a transforming economy where 30 of our fastest growing fields are going to require a minimum of a baccalaureate degree. And I was thrilled to learn about the nanotechnology grant from the National Science Foundation that the Seattle Community Colleges is going to be getting because that is a whole new field that didn't exist 10 years ago. And that's the intersection of computer science and biology and chemistry, and we've got a whole new nanoscience curriculum that wasn't on the books yesterday. So students will need to have multiple forms of education as they go through the trajectory of not only early learning, but through K-12 and on to higher education. We also have an enormous international skills gap. We're falling behind as a country. And just a few other things, about 75 million adults uh, here between the ages of 18 and 64 have no higher education in America at all. 
and they're not enrolled in any form of education. 15 million of those are older youth and young adults. They don't have a high school diploma. They don't have a GED. Um, 43 million are high school graduates but never went on to college. And 17 million completed some college but never got a degree. So if you look at the number of Americans we have, 300 million plus now, and you look at the fact that 75 million don't have higher education, and you look at the fastest growing fields and the economic and social challenges and demographic changes we're experiencing, we have what we call a gathering storm. We have a nation at risk, and we, that's why uh, I think when you introduced me, I feel this sense of urgency. I feel that we need to tackle these problems in much more sophisticated ways going forward. Now, on the other side, uh, high school graduation rates have fallen about 10 percent. Uh, it, since 1971, they were at 67 percent, I mean, 77 percent, and now they're at, at 67 percent. Um, we've got people going through from wealthy families that are certain to continue on to higher education, but just over half of the bottom uh, quartile of Americans who are from poor families go on, and only half of all college students in America actually graduate within six years, and if you look at the poor poorest students in America, only 25%. So we cannot wait. And we've got the fastest growing sector, community colleges. They are the gateway to higher education. You go from a community college to the state universities, to the University of Washington, to other four-year public and private institutions. And if you look at the demographic shifts, so many of their students get their start in a two-year college, that that is why I believe the president has shined a spotlight on this sector of higher education. And we also know from research that the tipping point is really increased earnings equate to at least 45 credit hours in higher education and some sort of certificate. So if you have that as a minimum, you will be able to go on and contribute as a public citizen in our, in our world. We've got, you know, the dropout problem. We've got, uh, we're furthering, uh, you know, further uh, falling behind in the achievement gap. And there was a report last April, if you get a chance to take a look at it, uh, where McKinsey reported that the United States is significantly lagging other advanced nations. And we're getting further behind in math, science, and literacy. So you'll see all of us in Washington and at your state level and in your superintendencies and your chancellorships talking about bringing us forward in math, science, and English, the basics. In 2006, we, were, we ranked 25 of 30 nations, and we were 24th of 30 in science. So 25 out of 30 in math, and 24th out of 30 in science. That's unacceptable. We're ranking behind Canada, the Netherlands, Korea, and Austria. And the president has said that he wants to, us to have, in the next decade, and he's called this the American Graduation Initiative. He wants us to have five million more college graduates in America. And what does that mean? That means that right now we're about 40 percent, 40 percent of Americans have a baccalaureate degree. Raise your hand if you have a baccalaureate degree. Let's just do a little test. Oh boy, highly educated group. Uh, and he wants us to pull that number up to 60 percent. Right now, Canada is at 51 percent. So Canada is my short-term target. The president's goal is my long-term target. We're tr going to track every single year in the next decade to meet the president's goal. How are we going to do that? We are going to look to the leadership of the superintendents to be working with the community colleges and the universities. We are going to be looking to the business community. One thing that America does not know well enough is that in today's world, two-thirds of our undergraduates in college work while they attend college. People do not have a mindset of this. It was interesting. I had to do an H1N1 webinar for, uh, I think it was about 400 colleges and universities uh, getting ready to, to really deal with the, the flu situation. And I was reading uh, a summary of, um, of the plan and the guidance that we actually have out on the web, and it's, it's very well done. 
but it spoke about preparing for situations like uh, what happens if the H1N1 virus affects a college or a university during Greek week? And I thought to myself, Greek week affects maybe less than 5% of the 6,000 colleges and universities in the country. And it's probably much more of a risk when you think of our higher education institutions as really being community centers for the regions in our country having theaters, having children's centers, having you know thousands of students going through higher education. But we have to really change the mindset of what we think about higher education. Most people think it's an 18-year-old student going through full time. That's how most of us in this room did it. It's not that way anymore. The average age is 28 to 30. It's a working adult. It's a person being more, more part-time than full-time. It may be a person coming back who didn't get a chance to go to college because she was raising a family. It may be someone transitioning from welfare to work who needs to get a job, needs to get a door in, and needs some basic skills to be able to get that job. It may be one of the dropouts that I mentioned. We have a whole mix of people coming into higher education. And that's why it's so important that the business community, Rotarians and others, really pick up the call to arms with education with K-12, with higher education, so that we can implement the American Graduation Initiative in a more, more sophisticated way. And I think I said this morning at the convocation at, at the Seattle Community Colleges, you know, I like a 20-20-20 model. Think about this. Um, we've got working students. Two-thirds of American undergraduates are working while they go to college. What if they work a minimum of 20 hours a week go to school 20 hours a week and study 20 hours a week. That's a 20-20-20 work week. And so we really are going to be reaching out to the business community. We're going to be working differently with the Department of Labor. We're going to try to link up the silos in funding so that we can be more efficient with the funds that we do have and really put them toward more students, not only getting into college on the one hand, but more throughput, more students graduating from college and being ready to ladder up to that next level in the workforce because we have this tremendous, tremendous workforce gap as well as an achievement gap. Now the President said back in April that we cannot lead in the 21st century unless we have the best educated, most competitive workforce in the world. And I think it's most of the reason why I said yes immediately and didn't hesitate when I was asked to go to Washington. The problems are enormous, but we have to have everyone in America participating to solve them. One thing that the President announced was the American Graduation Initiative. And to do that, he is going to, he proposed to implement uh, direct lending, that the federal government would take federal student aid and put in a solution which is called direct lending. So without going through a third party, which is the banking industry, we would be servicing the loans directly through the Department of Treasury, and then the banks and the lenders would service students on the other side. Direct lending is going to be a very exciting program, and it's going to save the government $87 billion over 10 years if we do that. That's envisioned in H.R. 3221. It's put forward by Congressman Miller. It passed the House last week. It's in the Senate, and I know your Senator Murray and others are working on that bill probably even today. And we're looking forward to those cost savings, some of which will allow us to fund increasing federal student aid to allow 2.7 poor students to come to college accessing Pell Grants and another million eligible for low-cost loans directly from the government. So that's a very exciting program. The remainder of those savings will be reinvested, as, as President Obama has proposed, into education. So we're very excited about that bill going forward um, to be passed, and you know, hopefully we will be able to get a solution to our health care crisis. And please don't ask me any questions about health care, because I have to defer to uh, Secretary Sebelius and others who are working nonstop in that regard. But education questions, absolutely. So we're very excited because these funds with the cost savings through implementing the federal student aid program will allow us to accelerate achievement. 
And people ask me, you know, what are you going to work on in Washington, D.C.? I say two words, double A, accelerating achievement, getting more throughput, getting students through college, doing everything we can to be smarter about the working student so that student will have the access and does need the job, does need to contribute to the family income, and will be able to complete the units necessary to get that certificate, to enter the job market, to get a degree like you all have, and move on, and many will become the senior scientists and the others that we look toward uh, leading our country in the future. So we're also, as part of this, working very closely with K-12, with our school system, because we know that the students, the, actually the seventh grade student today is the student that should have a baccalaureate degree in 2020. So if you look at the whole group of seventh graders, and I look at this as a short-term solution because I think in Washington you're asking us to think long-term. And one of the things the president has proposed as part of the American Graduation Initiative might seem a little funny, but to me it's critical. It's the first fund in the country that will focus on early learning, zero to five. And if you look at students uh, coming from the lower sectors, the lower income sectors of the economy nationally, students are coming to school hungry, students are coming to school without the parental guidance that you would expect every student should have access to. That zero to five age is not well understood in the research community, and it's certainly not linked as closely as it needs to be with the elementary school level. So the goal there being ready to learn at kindergarten, uh, after you get a good infusion of early learning and support from and parental responsibility and all the rest of it that goes along with that. So you'll see early learning linked to K-12. We have the race to the top. I know uh, Washington State is, is working and looking at those uh, dollars coming in from the Recovery Act to be able to be uh, put competitively t across America to really incentivize more throughput in K-12 to strengthen systems, to get more students graduating from high school. That's the job. And actually on Wednesday this week, uh, new common standards for the country have been released in math and English. So we ask you, if you're interested in this, to go out to the achieve.org website and take a look at those standards. And those of you who are mathematicians, uh, certainly the sailors love mathematics. They're usually, you know, physics, math graduates. Um, I don't know if that's what our, our new Rotarian was, was a, a math physics major and then went on to medical school. But um, if you look at the standards, we want to make sure that those standards mean college and workforce ready. That means 12th grade graduation ready to go on to college. Uh, I know in California we have a graduation exit exam that we've had in place for the last bunch of years. Uh, it's it's uh, calibrated on 10th grade reading and 8th grade math. You cannot have a graduation standard that means uh, that is not high school graduate level. So we're very excited that the National Governors Association have partnered with the school superintendents and have asked the scholars across America in the universities to really weigh in and say, do these standards, are these the standards that we're going to hang our hat on? And then once we have that, those will be the standards we measure entrance into college and beyond. So we're very excited about that. On the federal student aid side, we're very excited because we have many students that have not had opportunity to come in. And, you know, it's thrilling to be in Washington because we have a president who is complete, who is absolutely singularly committed to opening the doors of higher education to every American. And he has said that a minimum of at least one year of college should be a standard for the American people. We have fabulous faculty across the board, whether it's K-12 teachers or higher education professors. And we have a lot of things that we know work. We haven't had enough dollars to put toward those things that work. And we've spent a lot of those dollars helping students catch up. Two-thirds of the students that enter higher education are not prepared in math or English. We have to fix this problem and we can be more efficient taking those dollars and putting them toward college level work once we increase their preparation. How are we going to do it? We're going to do it with after school programs. We're going to do it with bridge programs. We're going to do it uh, working with the high schools to have students 
in college and high school courses if they can accelerate and students in prep courses when they get behind. So there are lots of ways to do this and we actually have the research community identifying what works. We just need to implement. So you'll hear me as your undersecretary talking a lot about implementation. We'll use the funding toward that end. We've got a, a, a president who is committed to higher education, committed to K-12, committed to early learning, and we have a secretary, Secretary Duncan, and hopefully you'll get to hear him if you haven't already, talking about the Barack effect, and it's the idea that the president and the first lady have made education a national imperative. And they are an example to all of us, but particularly, as you saw uh, in his talk to young people about personal responsibility, particularly to students, uh, to show what the benefits are of going through and getting your education. It's supposed to be the great equalizer. And the president himself is the son of a teenage mother and an absent father, and he was raised under very modest circumstances by his mother and grandparents. The government put his grandfather through college on the GI Bill, and the vice president's wife, Dr. Jill Biden, teaches uh, English in a community college. And Michelle Obama thought she wasn't good enough. She ended up getting her degree from Princeton. She used scholarships. Her father worked at a local water filtration plant. So we have tremendous leadership in Washington, and it's very hard for me to think about uh, any White House in my history that has such a personal and visceral belief in the power of, of education. So uh, let me close there and just tell you um, how thrilled I am to be in Seattle. I think you are in a center of innovation for the country. I think you're doing great work. I hope you apply for the new funds that will become available and really help us build upon the successes that you have so we can get more students through college. So I want to thank you very much, and we will now, I guess, take questions. Thank you so much. So questions, I see a few hands and our, oh, there you go. This is uh, really a naive question, but uh, it's basically, are, are you, do you have people, or is the industry, the teaching industry, thinking out of the box about how tremendously the world has changed since the internet? And I uh, find myself, I mean, the notion is that a person who's been out of school for f five or 10 years really doesn't know anything useful anymore unless they're constantly learning. So if most of the learning that needs to go on in the, in the society is in adults, and, and the adults can learn from the children, it seems to me we have to turn the whole model upside down and get the children and high school, college children engaged in useful research for the businesses and integrated with the businesses so that everyone's learning together and the uh, adults are, are learning as much as the children. That's sort of rambling, but I just wanted to know if you're really thinking out of the box, because it seems to me that the whole educational institution is obsolete. Well, one thing you can look at in the American Graduation Initiative, if you, if you type in HR 3221, you'll see a whole section on open educational resources. And there's a proposal that the president has made to leverage technology to deliver under, uh, a minimum of 150 world-class courses to anyone 365 days a year, 24 hours a day via the internet. And these would be prepared by faculty groups across the country and made available to everyone. It would raise the bar on the best of the best in curriculum, and faculty would be able to use part of it or all of it in their teaching. And I just learned actually this morning at the convocation at Seattle um, Community Colleges that actually Cable Green from Washington and others have already identified, I think you told me, uh, uh, Mr. Malone told me, that over, over uh, 150 courses already have been identified. So the question is, how can we play a role at the federal government to make you aware of these and then get people in who want the knowledge so that they can be working to improve their skills, get a door into higher ed, get back into school if they dropped out, and really leverage uh, the power of the internet to enhance learning. Uh, learning, we just finished a study in the federal government. It was, it was published uh, in the fall to compare 
fully distance learning with hybrid courses with traditional lectures. And what came out of that research, and this was looking at all of the research across the country over a, a series of years, was that, and you'll see this in our teaching, most of the faculty now ha are using the internet in their courses. It's not as sophisticated as maybe the courses in Department of Defense that has spent millions creating you know, a world-class curriculum that we hope to leverage and use. But you'll see a lot of exciting ideas coming forward. And we also have, the White House has a Center for o Social Entrepreneurship. So you'll see a lot of really great ideas. There's a new fund coming in called the 3I, Investing in Innovation. And that's going to be a call for challenge grants to faculty in, in K-12 schools to say, what ideas do you have that will increase achievement? How are you using technology? All manner of innovation that could actually, as I said before, accelerate achievement. Get higher quality learning, more accelerated learning, and more success so students can get those degrees and certificates to be successful. Last quick question. Uh, thank you very much for being here. Uh, I hope that uh, uh, one of the things that I question is how many days a year should a kid be going to school? It seems like that in most places in the world they go to school a lot longer, they get a lot more school hours than our kids do. Could you comment on that? Yeah, I think students should be learning all the time. <laughs> And I think there are informal networks and formal networks in our schools. And I think uh, some schools have adopted year-round. Others have adopted you know, the traditional calendar. I think we need to, as, as you said about innovation, really try to figure out who needs more education and how we can give students longer days that need them, shorter days when they can accelerate and do other things maybe to enhance their own learning. And I think, you know, one size doesn't fit all in today's America. This is the 21st century. So I think we have actually, if you ask me, that's another whole speech which I don't have time for. But, you know, I think we have to move from an agrarian model to a 21st century model that really follows kids and what they need. So if a poor kid starts first grade and they're behind 25%, of course they need a longer day, they need more learning. Can we afford that with the systems we have? That's really the challenge to the states and the institutions. But we cannot leave these kids behind any longer. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And I understand that this morning there was a, um, at the convocation at Seattle Community College that our um, former governor, Gary Locke, has helped get a um, grant so that we will be able to construct a building in, um, for leadership. And that coupled with a $6 million with the grant, a grant from the Gates Foundation is a huge accomplishment. And we share our congratulations with all of you. Thank you. Seattle Rotary Online is made possible in part by a grant from First Choice Health, working with the Washington Health Information Collaborative to use technology to bring better health care to patients throughout the Pacific Northwest. First Choice Health.